Good morning. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning will be from John chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was coming, that he should depart out of this world into, unto, his, unto the Father, out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Good morning. Good morning. It is great that everybody's here to worship God today. You know that we have a lesson plan. We are going to preach through the New Testament on Sunday morning for the next several weeks. We have that lesson plan in place. But we're going to pause the lesson plan uh, at least three times to uh, do what we have been doing for the last several, several years, and that is to complement what the Liberty Land classes are studying. On the last Sunday of every month, they, we try to take a moment to have a lesson that kind of complements what they're doing. The Liberty Land classes, for those of you visiting, are from kindergarten to the fifth grade. They meet in this wing out here, and they have various things, and they talk about a certain subject all month long. And so at the last Sunday, we try to uh, have something that will complement that for our auditorium lesson. And what they've been talking about this month is the Last Supper and Arrest of Jesus. The Last Supper and the Arrest of Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And they, no doubt they've been talking about Jesus in the upper room. There's an a artist a depiction of that where they're in this upper room. Jesus is breaking the bread and, he, and he's giving it out to his disciples. That no doubt they've been discussing how that the, the Last Supper, Jesus changed that, and he talked about the Lord's Supper that we've just now partook together. Know that they talked about how that he uh, was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and how all the folks left him and ran away from him and all these things. But today, let's consider someone who was right there. Right there the whole time. And that being is Satan. You know, Satan has been after Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. You remember when he was baptized by John in the Jordan River? And he, and he went out to the wilderness where he, where he fasted for 40 days, 40 nights. And, and at the end of that time, Satan come and, and said, I want to tempt you. I want to tempt you. He's been after him to, to fall. Satan didn't want Jesus to succeed in his, in his mission, in his work. And, and he tried to get him to, to fall into sin. But you remember the powerful weapon that, that Jesus used against Satan in the wilderness. You remember that? Every time Jesus said, for example, he said, Hey, these, you're starving. You haven't eaten anything in 40 days. Here's some rocks. If you are really the Son of God, then command these rocks to be turned to bread, and then you can eat, and, and that will show. Of course, that is temptation to abuse his power from God. Now, certainly, he could probably have done that, and no doubt he could. But he turned to Satan. He said, man shall not, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And every temptation that Satan hurled at him, Jesus turned around and said, it is written. When he said, fall down and worship me and I'll give you all these kingdoms, he said, it is written, you shall serve the Lord God and him only shall you serve. So Jesus used a powerful, powerful weapon against Satan early in his ministry, at the very beginning of it. It is written, the word of God, the word of God will put Satan on the run. If we want Satan to flee from us, then not only are we to resist them, we're to draw near to God. How do we draw near to God? We draw near to His Word. We learn what God says, what God wants, what is the right thing to do. And the more we saturate ourselves, our mind, our heart, our very being with the words of God, then when Satan comes against us, we have the powerful tool against him. No, you can't. God says no. God says I can't do this. God says I can do this. God says I should do this or I shouldn't do this. And so when we rely on the Word of God, that just destroys Satan and his attacks. 
So Satan did give up. He, he went away for a season, but he certainly didn't quit. He was always out to get Jesus and to thwart God's plan. And he was there, right there, when this was happening. The, the Last Supper in that upper room and on into his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane that night, Satan was there. And Jesus used a powerful weapon against him at this time too. And that powerful weapon is prayer. Prayer binds Satan. Satan was attacking right there. We're going to look at four words, and, and I like to use words that start with the same letter. So the first letter that w w the letter we're going to use today is the letter S. So if you're taking notes, we're going to use four S words. And these are Satan's attacks. Now, he attacks us many ways. Uh, he is so full of tricks and, and deceit. We can't just put him in a box and say, okay, this is how you defeat Satan. But we see during this time of the Last Supper and the subsequent arrest of Jesus that Satan attacks, and we're going to look at four ways that he did that, and we're going to see that Jesus countered that attack with prayer. Let's look at the first one. He will sift us. Sift us. Everybody go to Luke chapter number 22 in your Bibles. We're going to be looking at some passages. Uh, some I'll just uh, quote for you. Others I uh, want you to stop and look at. And this is one I want you to look at is Luke chapter 22. Look at verse number 31. Right there when Jesus was around that table and he was telling folks uh, that one of you will betray me and all these things that he was doing, look at Luke 22 verse 31. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, that's Peter. He's talking to Peter. Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Satan has desired to sift you. He's right here. And he has asked God, can I sift Simon Peter? And that is an attack that he's going to make right there during that process of, of events that's about to take place. What does it mean to sift something? Well, you know, when you process wheat all the way through, the first thing you do when you cut that wheat down, uh, and you, you have to separate it. You have to separate the the good from the bad. And, and that process is called winnowing. You, uh, you throw it up in the air. If there's a wind blowing, uh, some people don't have a natural wind, so they get a fan in their hand. And they'll f create a breeze. But they'll throw that wheat up, and the chaff will get blowed away, but the grain, which is heavier than the chaff, will fall back down to the ground. So what they do is they got a team that's pitching it up in the air, a team that's, that's got his fan in his hand, and he's blowing away the chaff, and they're sparing. The, so they're separating the good from the bad. That's the first process of, of the wheat. But then you've got to take that grain, and you've got to crush it. You've got to ground it. Now there's no doubt that Peter has already been separated. Paul, or Jesus came to Peter and to all the apostles, and, and he separated them. He said, look, I'm, I want you to follow me. And they did. So he took them out of the world. So he took the good and he separated them from the bad. So Peter's already been winnowed, but now he's got to be processed. He's got to go through that grinding process. He's got to be crushed. And Peter, Peter's been through that. Uh, remember the walking on the water when he sank? Save me, Jesus. And Jesus saved him. Remember up on the uh, Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus saw, or Peter saw Jesus and, the, and Moses and Elijah, and Peter said, let's build three tabernacles. And no, you hear him, not these other two. Peter's been through the great confession that Peter, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter's been through this, this process of being crushed and ground, and, and he's seen the resurrections of the dead, dead Lazarus and others, Jairus' daughter, and go on and on and on and see all the things that, Peter has been through since he was winnowed. Now Satan wants to sift him. If winnowing is taking the good and separating it from the bad, sifting is taking the bad out of the good. He's already been turned into flour. 
He's, he's been winnowed, he's been crushed, and now he's a powder, he's flour, and he's got some bad in him. And we got to get that lump out. We got to get those, those bad elements out. That's the sifting process. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, Satan's fixing to sift you. And it's not going to be pleasant. It's going to hurt. He's going to do some stuff for you. You're, and Peter is going to go through that sifting process. He's going to deny that he even knows. We all go through that. Satan attacks us with that. We're good folks. We're Christians. We've been baptized for the remission of our sins. We've been through some hard times in our life when our faith has been tested and we haven't quit. We're still here. But there's times we go through like a death of a loved one or a disease in our families or there's some sifting that's going on in our life that, that causes us to really evaluate and, 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 and really have to examine ourselves. Is there any bad in us that needs to be purified? Gold, tried in fire. That's that fine repurif purification process. And Satan will attack us with those types of things. And we can quit during that. Am I ready to forgive? Or do I want to get even? Am I ready to love? Or do I want to hate them? Those, those moments of where we're fine flour being sifted of all this bad that still may be in us. That's when Satan will attack and he will attack hard. And that's the point that we can quit. And, we, and our faith can be lost. And, and Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan's going to sift you. But let me tell you what I'm done. You're already there at Luke 22. Look at verse 32. But I have done what, class? Prayed for thee. Why? What did you pray for? That thy faith fail not when thou art converted and strengthened thy brethren. I know you're in that refining process that's going to test you to the, to the depths of your soul. That sifting process. Not the winnowing, not even the processing of crushing and grinding, but that sifting process to see who you really are. Are you really a child of God? Are you really a follower of Christ? Satan's going to get you, but I've prayed for you. Prayer was the powerful weapon that Jesus used against Satan during the sifting of Peter. And if we're being sifted by Satan right now, if there's something going on in our life that is sifting us, let's get into prayer. But that's not the only way Satan attacks. He also attacked by swaying. Satan has the power to sway us. You know what swaying means? It means to influence us. To go from one direction to another, to think one thing versus another. He can influence us. Don't think that he can't. Now, we are certainly have our own will. We make the choice, but Satan is there, and he is trying to sway us in his direction. You're in Luke 22. Look at verse number 2. Go all the way back up to verse number 2. The chief priests and the scribes, they sought how they might kill him. They want to kill Jesus, for they feared the people. They can't just kill him in public, because the public may kill them. So, in verse number 3, there entered Satan into Judas. Satan influenced Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being the number of the twelve. He's one of the twelve apostles. And Satan entered into Judas. He swayed Judas. He influenced Judas. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray them, him unto them. Judas had already chosen to be greedy. He had already chosen to be one that wants... He's, he's holding the bag. He was a, a thief. In John chapter number 12, verse number 6, uh, the Bible tells us that... He was a thief. So he's already got that in his heart. Greedy and covetousness and thievery. And Satan is using that. He said, okay, I know what he's got blackness in his heart. I know that toehold that I can get in on him. So I'm going to enter into that. And I'm going to use that to sway him. And he did. In John 13 verse 2, after supper was ended, the devil, listen, 
having now, this is what Don read just a few moments ago, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. When we've got a dark something in our soul, be it pride, anger, hate, jealousy, greed, whatever it is, Satan can use that. He can go right into that dark space and he can enter into or he can put it into our minds. Why? It's already there. It just needs to be cultivated. It just needs to be worked on and influenced upon. In John 13, 27, the Bible says, And after the sop, you remember Jesus got the sop and he told John, he said, uh, I'm going to give this sop, he sopped it up, this bread, to the one that's going to betray me. And he gave it to, to, to Judas. And the Bible says, after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus said to him, that thou doest, do quickly. Judas, you're going to betray me. I just told everybody, one of you is going to betray me. Judas himself said, is it I? He said, you said it. Judas had it in his heart. He was dark. And Satan was taking advantage of that every moment. That swaying of manipulating our hearts to do wrong. Satan is doing that to us every day. If we give him a toehold, if we, if we allow darkness to come into our fear, if it comes into our lives, then Satan can use that as a toehold to sway us in an evil direction. But Jesus prayed about it. Everybody go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. The entire chapter of John is a recording of a prayer that Jesus prayed. He has already left or he's leaving the upper room there. And they're making their way out to the Garden of Gethsemane. They're going to cross the Kidron in the, in the valley. And either right at the end of that room or maybe on their way or just as they get in the garden, he's going to give this prayer of John 17. And here's what he says in verse number 1. These words spake Jesus. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father. So we know this is a prayer. He's looking at God and he's praying to God. And he talks about in those first few verses how that he came to, to give his life and, and to do the will of God. But look at verse number 6. He said, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Manifest means to make known. So I have made known my name to these men that you've given me out of the world. You've, you've allowed, you, these are the apostles. They, you've, they're coming out of the world and you've given them to me. And I've told them about me and what I'm here to do and all of that. He says, thine they were and thou gavest them to me. And they have kept thy word. Remember, that's a powerful weapon that Jesus uses. Uses it against Satan. It is written, it is written, it is written. So the word of God, I've given it to them. And they've kept it. They've been, they've been listening to your words. Now, verse 7. They have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. Everything that I have is from you, God. And I made sure that these men knew that. 4. Verse number 8. I have given unto them the words which thou gave me. I've only told them what you told me to tell them. And this word, the word of God, is powerful and it's sharp and it can help them. And they have received them. These men, I'm praying to you, God, about these men and how that I gave them the word of God and this powerful tool, the word of God. And have known surely, they know surely that I came out from thee. They know that I'm the son of God. They know I come from you. And they have believed that thou didst send me. They, they've said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. They believe that you sent me. So verse 9, I pray for them. I'm praying for these men. 
I know that Satan is out there trying to sway them. They've received the Word of God in their hearts. They believe the Word of God. They believe that I'm the Son of God in their hearts. And I know that. And I'm so glad about that. But I don't want Satan to have any kind of toehold, any kind of sway on. So I'm praying for them. Now, I pray not for the world, but for them that thou hast given me. For they are thine. They belong to you. All mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. So, so I'm, I'm praying for these guys hard and, and deeply. Then he says, Holy Father, this is in verse number 11. He said, Now I'm no more in the world. These that I'm praying for are in the world, so I come to thee. I'm fixing to die. I'm fixing to go to you. These people are still going to be here. So he says, Holy Father, keep through thy own name, those whom thou hast given me. Please protect them and keep them. Keep also means to guard. Guard them. Please guard them. That they may be one. That they may be unified as, as we are one. Jesus and God. Verse number 12. While I was with them in this world, I kept them in thy name. I guarded them. I protect them. I kept them. Those that thou gave me, I have kept them. None of them is lost. But then he says this, but the son of perdition. That's Judas. That the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus knew that Judas would be swayed by Satan because of his greed and his thievery. And he allowed Satan to come into his heart and sway him. He knew that. So he said, I'm praying for these other men. That I can't stop that. The son of perdition has allowed Satan to sway him, but I'm praying that these people here will stay dedicated. Unfortunately, when they got out to the Garden of Gethsemane, just before they arrest Jesus, Satan attacked with sleep. Go back to Luke 22. Luke 22 and look at verse 46. Jesus had gone over to the Garden of Gethsemane. His 12, his 11, Judas is off getting up the chief priests and the temple guards to come and arrest him. But anyway, uh, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane and deeper into the garden he takes Peter, James, and John and, and then he goes in deeper into the garden and he prays. But here's what it, Luke twenty two forty six 46 says. He said unto them, Why? Sleep ye. He went further into the garden. He fell down on his face and he prayed to God, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but your will. And then he got up from prayer and he went back to his apostles and they were asleep. And he asked them, Why sleep you? Then he says something amazing. Rise and what, class? Pray. Rise up, get up, don't go to sleep. And the way to do that, and the way to, to protect yourself against Satan's attack here, is to pray. Get up and pray, lest, he goes on to say, you enter into temptation. Satan is here in this garden. He was with us in the upper room to sift Peter. He's going to be with with sifting Peter. I pray for Peter. He's got Judas. He's swaying him. Judas is out doing his thing. I pray for him. I pray for y'all. And let me tell you, now Satan is attacking you with sleep. Fleshly weakness. When our fleshly, physical selves get weak and we succumb to the temptation of lust of the flesh, we succumb to the temptation of something that the flesh wants. In Mark chapter 14, verse 38, the same instant that Mark said, here's how he recorded it. Watch you and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is what, class? Weak. Satan is attacking you on a flesh basis. Oh, he's sifting you, he's swaying you, but he's also attacking your flesh. He knows your weaknesses. He knows what he can do to, to trip you up. And he's seeking a way to just eat you up. So here's the answer. Pray. 
Rise and pray. Watch and pray. Matthew puts it like this in Matthew 26, beginning at verse 40. He comes to his disciples. He finds them asleep. He says to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me for an hour? I'm down here in the, deeper in the garden praying. Could you not do that? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. He used that again. Satan is tempting you. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away the second time. And here's what Peter did, or Paul, Jesus did. He prayed. He went away the second time and prayed. And when he come back, he found them asleep. Again, Satan was attacking them in their fleshly realm. And he is not going to give up. But then, if he doesn't get David Conley by sifting me, by putting me through the ringer to see what I really am, are you truly a Christian? Are you really going to stay faithful when I sift you? Or he, he can't sway me because I'm not allowing stuff in for him to get that toehold in. And physically, I'm going to say no. No to sin. I'm not going to do that sin. I'm not going to be weak in that area. Then he may hit me with pure old de sorrow. Just pure O.D. sorrow. Luke chapter 22, verse 45. When he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping, but they were sleeping for sorrow. Jesus himself was full of sorrow. In Mark 14, 34, he says unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. How much, Jesus? Unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. I am being attacked with overmuch sorrow. Things are happening in my life that's causing me grief and pain and sorrow. It's not in the sifting process because, yes, it's happening in my life that's causing some problems, but it's kind of seeing who I really am. Am I really a Christian? Am I really faithful? Am I really going to tell the truth or am I going to lie? Those sorts of things. I'm going to sift it out of me. Am I going to deny Jesus or am I not going to deny Jesus? I'm going to confess Jesus. But this is just pure old sorrow. And Jesus says, I am so sorry. I'm in a sorrowful condition in my life. It's got, it, I'm, I'm so sorry to, to death. Now Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, that godly sorrow works repentance. That's a good thing. To be sorry for our sins is a good thing. To have our heart broken for our sinful activities is a good thing. Why? Because it can lead us to repent and to do better. But he went on to say that godly sorrow will work repentance to salvation, but the sorrow of the world works death. And Jesus said, I'm so sorry to death. I'm getting, I'm in a pain. I'm in a work, I'm in a world of hurt. I need you to pray for me. And these disciples were so sleepy because they too had been overwhelmed with much sorrow. We cannot let sorrow steal us. Satan can use that to attack us in weak times. And of course, Jesus went into the garden, being sorrowful, he prayed. He prayed. That was his way to fight Satan. Prayer binds Satan in all these areas. And we have hope because we're not always going to be sorrowful. We've got to understand, sorrow is not all. We're going to be sorrowful on this earth. Bad things happen. But in Revelation 21 verse 4 it says, God shall wipe away all the tears from the eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow. There's going to be no crying. There's neither going to be no more pain. All the former things of sorrow and, and physical weakness and being tempted by Satan and being sifted by Satan, that's all going to be done away with. We're going to be in heaven someday. And our heart will be rejoicing. Back to John chapter 17 in that prayer. Verse number 20 is an amazing part of Jesus' prayer. John 17. Here's what he says in verse 20. 
Neither pray I for these alone. I'm not just praying for the apostles here tonight. But for them also, I'm going to pray for somebody else. Two. Who? I'm praying for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So when Peter writes the letter, 1 Peter or 2 Peter, and I believe that. Or when Peter gets up on the day of Pentecost and preaches that first gospel sermon, and I believe that. I believe on Jesus through Peter's word. That's me. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, prayed for me. He prayed for you. I'm praying for them which believe on me through these men's word. That's us. And in verse 24, he says, Father, I will or I want that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. I want them to go to heaven. I want the apostles to go to heaven. I want all Christians that believe on me through their words to go to heaven. I want them to see me and be with me in my glory. Folks, if you want to go to heaven, then you must follow God's plan of salvation. Satan is attacking us every way that he can. And if he's attacking you today, and you need the prayers of this congregation. You've got the prayers of Jesus. He's already praying for you. You need the prayers of this congregation to say, pray for me that I may withstand the attacks of Satan. If that's you today, then we would love to pray for you. We'd love to join Jesus and pray for you. If you need that, why don't you come? While together we stand and sing the song selected.